And when we turn to Revelation, the 21st chapter, we turn here um, because of a discussion that we had during second hour last week as we pondered around a table of how to continue to grow as a healthy and holy multi-ethnic community that glorifies the Lord. Um, and this um, scripture, Cedric, who's uh, leading that class, lifted up the scripture of Revelation 21, and, and we were talking about how it is, it's the place where we're going, and we need to be able to see it so that we know how to walk. So beloved ones, hear these words of scripture that are a vision of the glorious end of our story. St. John writes, Then I saw new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the second death. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, these words are holy and power-filled. God, renew our minds in Christ. Nourish us with these words so that we might have the strength and the heart and the hope and the vision to walk joyfully in the narrow way of Jesus, who is our truth and our life and our way of living. God, I ask that you, by the power of your spirit, would just remove all of the wrong and twisted ways we have read these words and heard these words in the past and reveal your glory and your goodness to us here so that we might become the people that you created us to be and have abundant new life in and with Jesus and one another. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Church, the whole of Revelation is a poem. And I don't say that to you as a way of saying that it's not true and not real. It is true. It is real. I say that the whole of Revelation is a poem because that is the way I am telling you that these truths, these words are the most true and most worthy of trust. And I stake my life upon the deep truth they reveal. 
These words in Revelation are a poem because there is a level of infinite and eternal truth that our finite minds can only grasp through art. Poems can testify to the real and eternal in a way that prose words cannot. So if you say to me, Pastor Kate, how do I get to the store? If that's your question, I'd say, well, take a left out of the parking lot, go straight through two lights, turn right at the third light, and it's the fourth building on your left. But if you ask me, Pastor Kate, is everything going to be okay? If you tell me I'm scared and sad and worried about the future, I'm heartsick when I think of prisoners and captives and people's cleaning blood stains out of rugs in their family homes, of people digging through rubble with their bare hands trying to free crushed children, of families sheltering in place for days in Lewiston, of people in Acapulco devastated by a hurricane that I didn't even learn the name of because the world is so brutal in these days. If the question you're asking me is, this world is so beautiful and this life is so brutal and also wonder-filled and I am terrified to love creation and this life and my people because it makes me so vulnerable, is it going to be okay? If your question is, how do I live with hope and not despair? How do I walk in what I'm for and not what I'm against? The answer to those questions is a holy and eternal truth that cannot be contained in our finite human words. The closest we can come to capturing and conceiving the beautiful infinite goodness of God is a holy poem like Revelation. So this is a poem, church, which is to say that it is the deepest, fullest, realest truth that we can hear. A truth that transcends into eternity. And you cannot explain it with maps and dates and code decipherers. But you can behold it in awe and wonder. And then sit with Mary and the Holy Spirit and ponder its meaning in your heart. If you look around, you look at the world around us and the ones that you cherish and the ones you cherish who are not with us any longer and your heart catches in your throat and tears fill your eyes and you don't want to argue or debate or leverage secret truth or fight the culture war for power or advantage, but you just want to know, will it be okay? Maybe not always now, but someday, will it be okay so that you have the heart strength to face tomorrow with defiant gentleness and reverence and faith? Then God in Christ through the Holy Spirit answers that question through a vision to an exiled poet pastor on the Isle of Patmos. He has this ecstatic, holy vision that reveals truth and destroys illusions. And we call it revelation because it is. And by the time you get to the stanzas in the poem that we read this morning that we call chapter 21, if you read all the way through, then you've already seen the last battle and the binding of Satan, and you've seen the thousand year celebration with Christ on the undemonized earth, and you've seen the liberating collapse of Babylon, which is John's spirit given name for every imperial force, every empire nation built on the myth of redemptive Alliance, re redemptive violence, the lie that war can make peace. And now you come to the point in the poem where you see new heaven and new earth because the old ways of destruction and threat and oppression have passed away.
And it is so new that we can barely recognize its continuity. John says the first heaven and the first earth were full of the ways of killing and separating and fearing and fighting. And those have gone and all is made new. And what you see here is not a different replacement heaven and earth. As the most preeminent biblical scholar, as the most ironically named biblical scholar on the book of Revelation, I swear I'm not making this up. This guy studies the book of Revelation and his name is Eugene Boring. <laughs> but as he says, and you've got to understand this because Christians do not understand this. As he says, God does not make all new things. God here makes all things new. So God isn't throwing up and destroying and throwing away the old heaven and earth. God is renewing. And, and the vision says here in this new heaven and renewed earth, there is no longer any sea. And you have to understand what that means for John and his people. The sea that was the ocean, but it was also a symbol of everything, chaos and fear and disorder and unknown and destruction. And even in Genesis 1, the vision of creation, we see the seas. It's called the many waters there on the second day after God makes light. And what God does is separate the waters from under the sky from the many waters above the sky. So there is sea on earth and in heaven. The wild chaos is there. There, but it is contained and limited. And throughout the scripture story, the presence of the sea and the beasts within it are a metaphor, metaphorical truth for all that we cannot know or control and all we fear will destroy us and separate us from God and life and goodness. And the sea is all too real throughout scripture. But here in this penultimate vision, John sees renewed heaven and renewed earth. And here there's no sea at all. Earlier in the vision poem, John sees the sea like glass, still, still and transformed, made calm by the throne of Christ. But now there's no sea at all. There is no longer any mysterious force to fear. All is light. All is calm. All is bright. New heaven, new earth. And then John sees the holy city and it is new Jerusalem and it is coming down out of heaven from God. And it helps you here to see the fullness of revelation. If you know the story of Babel in Genesis 11, if you know the story from the prequel about how God, people got together to build themselves a city and it was a grand plan to get to heaven, but not have to mess with God or worship or anything sacred. They would build this grand city together. It would be a straight bypass to heaven and it would bypass God altogether. And God knocked down that mighty city of Babel and gifted humans with multiple languages because we were made in the image of God, made holy and complete to be completed with God's holiness. We were made to need union and communion with God. We were not made to make an unholy grab for eternity through the raw power of technology. So see here now how God who was born among us, God who always tabernacled and dwelled with God's people, even in the midst of the wilderness, God on the renewed heaven and earth brings down a holy city, a new Jerusalem, not built by human hands, but of God and from God to us because God is a tabernacling God. We don't have to build or manufacture holiness. God gives God's whole holy self a city not made by human hands, a city like a bride dressed for the marriage union with husband. God gives new Jerusalem for a life of deep and transformative intimacy and unity. And now the voice says, now the dwelling of God is with humans and God will live with them. And do you see church how this has been the story all away, all along? And the voice goes on to say, they will be his peoples 
and you might be reading an English translation of the Bible, I think most of us are, you might be reading an English translation of the Bible like the NIV, and if you are, if you have the NIV or the NRSV, go and check it, and go and mark up your Bible, because it might say, God will dwell with God's people, but the, but the revelation, the original revelation through the Spirit to John, the earliest manuscripts, it's God will dwell with God's peoples, plurals. And the scribes changed the vision early on, carved it down to fit our expectations. And as war rages in the Middle East for control of a holy city built by human hands, we are stuck in the belief that there can only be one holy and beloved people chosen by God, dwelling with God. So we have to banish and destroy and fear and kill the other. They must be unholy so that we can be holy. That's what we think. But the vision that the Spirit gave to John said in the renewed heaven and in the renewed earth, the holy city comes down from God so that God could dwell with her peoples and God will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is sitting on the throne, and we know that's the lamb who was slain and made alive again through the power of the resurrection. That lamb who was slain and is now resurrected sits on the right ruling hand of God Almighty. He who is seated on the throne says, I am making all things, all things new. I am making everything new not destroying or discarding. I am making all things new. And the vision goes on to say, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true, and we would never believe them. We would never imagine them. We have to write them down because they are trustworthy and true. This is the vision that God gives the church. And we have to receive it as a vision, a poem, and a revelation. We can't see it with our human eyes. We can't plan for it. We can't execute it. We can only glimpse it. We certainly cannot look at human history and the brutal reality around us and expect that this is the end of the story. This is an unfathomably good news. How can this be? because nothing is impossible with God. Our fallen and bruised suffering hearts anticipate an end with cosmic fire and fury and annihilation. It is all too easy for us to imagine and anticipate and maybe cheer on a story that ends in cataclysmic suffering and destruction. But we have to anticipate the end that comes from the vision God gives us. We can't conceive a power greater than fear and violence and death. We can't imagine it or dare to dream it, let alone trust it. And so God must show us. And the only human words wide enough to contain God's glory is this holy poem full of the fullness of new life. The cataclysm at the end of the cosmos is renewing life there's an explosion of salvation and redemption and reconciliation. And if we believe it and walk accordingly, the world will call us fools. And you have to know that to be a fool for Christ is the highest form of wisdom. This is the only second coming that bears any resemblance to the first coming of a God who comes down and is born among us weak and vulnerable as a baby, a God who comes down to dwell with us, a God whose holiness is contagious and transformative, a God who gives not just us, but all creation, second birth and new life everlasting. We read the whole revelation with our fallen wisdom, and so we focus on the struggle and the destruction and the fear and the terror, and we think, well, that must be the end. That's what we expect. We fear it. It's certainly familiar. Of course, that's going to be the end. But friends, look around. That's not the end. That's the present and the past. Powers and principalities of evil crushing the weak and the poor and the oppressed. We look around at our story now and in the past, and it's a story of violence and war and greed and fear and oppression and alienation and destruction and those powers rule almost uncontested in our world. To believe that there's any other way, any higher power to worship is to be a loser and a fool. But we know 
To put our hope in Christ is to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. And only then will we find new life and new birth. We know that Jesus of Nazareth showed us how to be a whole and holy human and resist demonic powers. And we know those principalities had the power to lead him like a lamb to slaughter. And on the cross, if we have eyes to see, we see the glory of God overcoming all that we fear. We see Jesus absorbing evil and violence and sin and death and not seeking vengeance or destruction, not fighting with the powers of this world, but in this holy power, making all things new. And on the third day, he rose again. And Jesus Christ is resurrection power's first fruits. And because he lives, we have nothing to fear. We can face today and tomorrow and anticipate with joy God's triumphant ending. We know that the resurrection power broke the forces, the powers of evil and sin and death. And that power is for us and not against us. And it's greater than sin and brokenness and violence. And we trust that power, the power of Christ. And so as John's vision continues, we hear the voice and understand what he's saying when he says to John, who is separated from everyone he loves by the imperial force of Rome and by the sea, who has no hope of prevailing or having a happy ending on this earth. But when the spirit says to John and to or us, it is done. When the spirit says to John, I am the alpha and the omega, I am the beginning and the end. What we hear and understand is the beginning, the alpha is God creating, bringing beauty and order out of the chaos and unformed void. And then the end, the omega, here is God recreating and redeeming and bringing order and beauty out of all the violence and chaos and rebellion of the destructive void. We hear, we see we understand and we walk accordingly in the beginning God in the ending God that's the revelation the new Jerusalem it's not one place in one time not one event the new Jerusalem is God the revelation is not a what or a where or a when it's a who God triumphant and it's a triumph that's not like what we know in fear it's not a triumph that destroys it's a triumph that heals and redeems and restores God is all in all and when we say every knee bows we don't mean under threat of destruction we mean every knee bows healed and whole and joyful and free choosing to praise Redeemer, not coerced praise, but cries of relief and liberation and joy. God, everything to everyone, and once again, as it was in the beginning, good, very good. And the vision goes on to all who are thirsty, to all those who see and long to be filled for, with this goodness, to all who are thirsty for a hope that's not a fish hook in the mouth, for all who are thirsty for a hope that is beyond our capacity to even imagine, to all who are thirsty for the living water of salvation and redemption, God says, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those who overcome, to those who resist, to those by the power of grace who stand to the end, I will give, not they will earn, but I will give, and they will inherit all things. I will be her God, she will be my daughter. I will be his God, he will be my son. I will be their God. They will be my children and heirs. And look, I'm going to tell you, verse 8, real talk, I don't like it. <laughs> it terrifies and disturbs me. If I were writing the Bible, I'd cut it out. <laughs> But this isn't my vision to alter or edit. It's the one that the Spirit gave John on Patmos. And I really don't understand how this lake of fiery sulfur exists in the middle of all of this glorious newness. But here's how I read it. All the old ways, and anyone who refuses to turn from them, 
anyone, any power, any institution who chooses the power of destruction and death over the power of healing and shalom and reconciliation. Anyone who chooses any lies or violence or deceit or the craven self-serving de de destroyers, those who believe in and worship the power of oppression and alienation and destruction, there's no place for any of that in new creation. All that stands against all that resists the flood of God's fiercely gentle redeeming grace, it will be defeated. God will be all in all. And anything that ever was that will not return to God will be no more. And here's how I read it. God's grace is gentle, but it is not weak. It is and will be triumphant. So there is nothing for us to fear. Jesus always asks people, not what do you believe, but how do you read it? And so I read it like this. The end is good news, glorious beyond our capacity to conceive. All comes from God. All will return to God. His kingdom will be without end. All are welcome. No one will be forsaken or left out. It is never too late. But unlike the kingdoms and powers of this earth, no one will be coerced. What does this mean? Knowing all this, how do we live? All throughout this moment, as we've been seeking meaning from God's truth and the life of these words, Stephanie has been sitting in front of us, weaving the names of those we love, those who are not lost, but who are separated from us by the power of death. She is weaving our sorrow, our thanksgiving, our remembering, our hope, our longing, our tears. She is weaving it into something new, something beautiful, something that does not ignore or deny pain, but to the glory of God includes and transforms even that which destroys into new creation. And some of you from where you're sitting in the sanctuary, you can see it really well. Some of you are in the back and you can see just a little bit or only catch a glimpse when she holds it up. Some of you can see nothing at all. You can only hear me saying that I see it. And it is not yet finished. But it will be. But it will be. Because God is a master artist, a master creator, a master weaver, and all things will be woven together for good new creation. Amen.